very yeah. important for us. This is our dharma. This is what we must do, you know. And the exactly. others, uh, others can do whatever else they have to do. They are supposed to do so. Uh, so as soon as Chris joins, we'll we'll start then. Uncle, are you in touch with him? The chapel is joining in. Okay. Terrific, wonderful, that's great. I see some new faces. I see. Uh, I see uh, uh, Srinivasanji. Can you say a few words about yourself, Srinivasanji? Because others may not know you. Uh, Srinivasanji, would you like to introduce yourself briefly, please? If you can hear me. Oh, there's, there's Professor Chris Chappell. Welcome, welcome. Namaste. Namaste. How are, you? How are you, Chris? Good to see you. Good to see you. You're looking as fit as ever with all your yoga and everything. I see on mute. Uh, ah, mute pen. Where on mute for you? Please, please uh, unmute. Chris G, please unmute. Can you unmute? Okay, now I'm unmuted. Oh, terrific. I haven't been on Wednesdays for a long time, so good to see you all. Good to see you. Pankaj and Itmar and Bakran. Wonderful to hear your voice, and uh, if you permit, we'll get started right away, if that's okay with okay. you. Yes, yeah, certainly. Great, great, great. So I request everyone else to unmute for the time being, and uh, uh, rather a mute for the time being, not unmute, and then when you want to speak, you should unmute yourself. Uh, so friends, uh, welcome to the second day of our uh, conference on beyond the imperialism of categories, we had, uh, you will all agree, a very rich sharing yesterday. I especially welcome Professor Chris Chappell, who is our principal speaker this morning. And later, another friend of ours, Jeffrey Long, will join us, I think, with a video recording. Given the time difference, I think in LA, it must be 9.30 or 9.39 or 9.40. Uh, at night, I'm very grateful to friends from the U.S. for joining in. Pankarji, it's probably later for you there. And uh, soon you'll be falling asleep. But till then, till then, we have you in our midst. We have friends from Israel joining in. A special welcome to them. And, uh, of course, our own fellows. Very important. Uh, if you've seen the new schedule, we've had a... a, a a session this afternoon where we had a bit of a time slot vacant where the fellows of the institute will also join in and give us their views and their inputs uh, i must say for those who are joining in for the first time today that this is a series of conferences events roundtables symposia at the institute that we are organizing on the broader theme of rethinking indology or Indic studies. I mean, we talked a bit about Indology, uh, the problems with the term, and also the advantages, because Indology can be translated as Bharat Vidya, uh, which has multiple meaning. Uh, just a very brief segue from yesterday uh, for a connection. We had a lovely session in the end, uh, the last session of the day, uh, with. Uh, uh, with uh, Professor Nataraju, a philosopher, and uh, Lavanya Ji, uh, who is in the U.S. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to mention a couple of words about that session so that we can uh, connect with it. 
So I think uh, one of the things that emerged from that session is that uh, when we talk about new directions in Indology, the critique has to be in some ways bi-directional. That obviously we critique, uh, so to speak, Western representations of India, but we also critique ourselves. And Natarajuji said this beautifully when he said that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Indian scholars, uh, you know, don't have to be reactive. They have to learn to read their own texts in the original languages if they are doing Indology with any degree of seriousness. And as a trained philosopher, he also talked about the importance of methodology. Otherwise, your knowledge, whatever it is you say, will not be accepted in the wider community of scholars across the world. And of course, uh, any discipline, especially Indology, is a dialogue across uh, nations, across countries, across civilizations, uh, you know, going back to Megasthenes and uh, and Schwenson. Obviously, it's a dialogue between how others see us, how we see ourselves, and uh, the boundaries between us and them are usually blurred, uh, as I pointed out yesterday. Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, sympathetic outsiders who know our own traditions oftentimes better than we do ourselves. And uh, of course, we, some of us have studied uh, uh, Western civilization very deeply and have a certain sympathy for it. Uh, and at the same time, Indology is a worldwide, uh, uh, worldwide enterprise today. There are scholars in Kyoto, there are scholars in Israel, and uh, there are scholars in Europe, uh, there are scholars in China and other parts of the world. So it's not just a West versus the rest or the West versus the East type of enterprise at all. And all knowledge is a cooperative enterprise, right? And uh, we must, as it were, work together for an enabling Indology, right? And there are so many voices that are waiting to be heard. I remember this wonderful painting, very telling it is, of uh, William Jones, you know, in some ways the father of Indology, if you want to call him that, uh, if, if you consider Indology a systematic study by the West of India. And, uh, uh, you know, seated below him is, uh, is a pandit, Rutyunjaya Vidya Lankar, you know, and uh, the body language and their uh, placement tells a story, a very post-colonial story of an asymmetry in, in knowledge. Uh, but I think this is what, uh, uh, you know, Lavanyaji mentioned, because uh, Pankaji asked her a very important question. Uh, he said, what is the connection between Itihas and history? And she made a very important point. She said, history, as it has been defined, uh, is a set of protocols. And it excludes certain kinds of evidence, certain kinds of documents, certain kinds of uh, uh, inputs, say the Puranic inputs, for example. So I think that uh, long ago, uh, it was Arvind Sharma who gave us a felicitous phrase when he said that uh, uh, dharma, he said dharma is the categorical imperative, not a categorical imperative. He was twisting or playing or tweaking Kant. And it is these categorical imperatives which, in a sense, define our field today. Uh, because when protocols are set in a certain manner, a lot of knowledge, cultural memory, testimonies, and uh, other sources of understanding are excluded. And I think uh, Chris Chappell is a pioneer in this regard. I remember a wonderful paper. I've read a lot of stuff he's written. He's a very, he has a very fertile mind. Uh, uh, and, you know, uh, one of the great scholars today uh, in the US, a bridge of understanding. He's a Doshi scholar. I, I, we are missing Mr. Doshi also, in fact, and his wife, uh, Pratimaji. Uh, it's uh, And, uh, you know, he comes every year, he leads uh, uh, a summer school in Jain studies. But I remember this wonderful essay he wrote on postures in yoga. And one of the great essays where he says that uh, all the animal postures, you know, indicate uh, not, not only a synergy when we want to harness uh, the power of animals, but also a kind of, uh, you know, because every god has a vahana, which is an animal, but it's not just that, but it's, it's also 
about uh, you know the rights of animals you know today we talk about animal rights and i think giants have talked about animal rights long before anybody else and our, our panel this morning is on jaina thought uh, but the last thing i wanted to say is that i want to wish everybody a happy eid eid ul fitr i'm told the moon sighting by the mullahs in india uh, says that eid will not be today but tomorrow but those who want to celebrate it we wish them all a very peaceful and happy eid a meeti eid that is called uh, uh, Ritika ji is in in Lucknow. I hope she gets some good sevaiya uh, and other good foodies. I know she's a vegetarian, but uh, whatever the good foodies are there, she should eat those. And uh, so, uh, in our plural society, we we welcome plurality. Our second paper is on anekantvad. I think a very radical pluralistic approach. And in our open session, I'm going to talk about a penta lemma. of indian studies or indic studies or indology i mentioned intermedial hermeneutics yesterday but just a glance of the penta lemma so the, i i construct this in this fashion uh, at uh, the 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 first uh, the first leg of this is when uh, you know uh, it's what i call the intra sanatani when let's say uh, the shaivites talk to the vaishnavites or the different forms of vaishnavism talk to each other or the different forms of uh, uh, you know advaita uh, you know uh, from uh, uh, shankara's advaita to uh, you know vishishta advaita to advaita advaita and uh, shuddha advaita of uh, of dharma vallabha so this is an intra sanatani dialogue this this makes one leg of this tetralemma and then there is the dialogue between the sanatani and the co sanatani yesterday we talked about a lot uh, we talked a lot about the dialogue between the buddhists and the hindus especially the nayayikas right and their counterparts and bob thurman's uh, paper uh, presentation talk was all about retrieving the sanskrit corpus from its tibetan translations so the dialogue between hindus and jains between nayayikas and bauddhas uh, the 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 dialogue between hindus and sikhs uh, you might call it the dialogue between the sanatani and the co sanatani and then there's the uh, exchange between the sanatani and the non sanatani what are the non sanatanis in a way the abrahamics the marxists the modernists and maybe the chinese the some would say the chinese are co sanatanis the taoists uh the ancient greeks the shintos uh maybe uh the confucians are the co sanatanis because they're not radical uh, and incommensurable areas of difference between them but sanatani non sanatani is a very viable dialogue especially the dialogue between the sanatani and the modern vivekananda gandhi aurobindo everybody was worried about modernity and uh, the kind of rationality that it enthroned but the dialogue between the sanatani and the non sanatani uh, the dialogue between say the marxists and and uh, the advaitins and then finally the dialogue between the sanatani and the anti sanatani that's when things get a bit fraught a bit tricky so this was my penta lemma and we'll talk about it in the open session i just mentioned it because our friends in the us will be asleep by then but even so uh with these words i want to welcome chris once more i want to welcome viraj shah who's going to uh conduct this session and i turn it over to my friend uh pankaj jain who's actually the convener of this conference uh i i congratulate him for his effort he he landed uh, running as it were from the us he joined flame university and within a couple of months he's doing 100 different things and uh, we wish you well pankaj ji you are a leader and uh, we are going to support you go ahead go ahead pankaj i just want to welcome professor chapel who was my phd advisor one of the advisors in the committee external reviewer and uh, with his guidance i could complete my phd and and his expertise on hinduism and ecology jainism and ecology pioneer books still the you know gold standard in the field of environmental study with that i turn over to professor viraj shah who can formally introduced professor chapel professor viraj sir my colleague at flame university sorry yes please please professor 
Thank you, Professor Jain and Professor Paranspe. Uh, we welcome all of you in this fourth session uh, on Jainism and Jain studies. Uh, I'll briefly introduce myself. Uh, I'm Virat Shah. I'm an associate professor at Fame University, and I specialize in, uh, I'm an archaeologist, but I specialize in Jain art, uh, iconography. Yesterday, Professor Paranspe mentioned uh, Elora Caves. So my thesis is on, on Elora Caves, and I specialize mostly on Jain art, architecture, and iconography. And I would like to talk about that later, but welcome uh, all of you and welcome Professor Chapel. We are very lucky to have you with us. So we, in this session, we have two papers. Uh, one is a recording by Professor Jeffrey Long, but we'll start with Professor Christopher Chapel, and uh, he will talk about uh, Jain studies in the global economy, uh, global academy. Now, Professor Christopher uh, Chapel, those of you who don't know, is a very distinguished scholar. He's a Doshi Professor of India, Indic and Comparative Theology, and founding director of the Master of Arts in Yoga Studies at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. He's a specialist in all Indian religions, and has published more than 20 books. And his the latest publication, which is Living Landscapes, uh, Meditations on the Elements in Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain Yogas has been published by Sunni Press. Uh, he serves as an advisor to multiple organizations, uh, including the Forum on Religion and Ecology at Yale, the Ahinsa Center at Pomona, the Dharma Academy of North America at Berkeley, uh, the Jain Study Centers at Soyuz, London, the South Asian Studies Association and International School for Jain Studies at New Delhi, and he teaches online uh, through the Center for Religion and Spirituality and Yoga Club. So, Professor Chapel, we are very lucky to have you, and please, we hand over to you. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, and it's my honor to be with you, to see old friends and to make new friends. And I wanted to first speak concern to Israel, to Gaza, and speak concern to the many people who are suffering with COVID-19 in India at present. And our hope is for peace and for good health and vaccinations. And I just uh, really applaud the physicians who have given countless hours and all of the healthcare workers. And I just certainly hope that the problems in the Middle East cool down very, very soon. Now, in speaking about the global study of Jainism, I'm going to share some methodological reflections. And Makaran was already lifting up some of the issues that we confront about the methods we use for the study of religion and of theology and of philosophy. I also want to share some sort of news and quite often in academic gatherings, we don't really get to share news, but there's actually a fair amount of news in regard to the study of Jainism throughout the globe. So first, historically, oh, and also I'm um, gonna be slightly autobiographical because uh, so much of the story is tied up with my own evolution as a professor and as a scholar. So I want to start by just explaining the relative lack of information, just basic information about Jainism, the Jain traditions, recently meeting for the past two or three decades, and when one would open a textbook, one would see that Jains hate the world, that Jains are phobic about food, that Jains are peculiar people, 
And the textbooks, which we know are long problematic, uh, just we're getting really basic things incorrect, sort of saying that Jainism is a sect of Hinduism or that um, Jainism is newer than Buddhism. I mean, the, the errors were just really quite remarkable. And then things shifted. In 1979, Professor Pabinam Jaini at Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, wrote a book called The Jaina Path of Purification. And this book was published just as I was finishing my doctoral work. And as I read this book the next year as it came out, and as I taught from this book uh, back at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, where I began my career as a lecturer, I was transfixed, transformed, and transported. Okay, transfixed because the opening is so electrifying. And this book opens with a description of Salekana, also known as Santara, a vow taken to move into death through caloric reduction. And he describes at the very opening the passing of Shanti Sagara who had gone up to a mountaintop and had followed the scriptural injunctions to stop eating, stop eating, stop drinking, and then some 40 days generally one passes on. And I was just absolutely taken with the starkness, but something struck me as really, really beautiful. So I found that aspect of learning about Jainism transfixing. Now, the second was transforming. And uh, my own background is that as a teenager, as a 13-year-old, I undertook uh, a daily practice that I continue in altered form of meditating. And I interviewed Philip Kaplow, who had founded the Zen Center of Rochester. He had studied for a dozen years with Yasutani Roshi in Tokyo and was invited by uh, the founder of Xerox, uh, Chester Carlton, and the descendants of the founder of Kodak Company, the camera company, to come. This was a Vedanta group that decided that they were shifting over into Buddhism for a long reason that involved Houston Smith. And my friend and I went and we interviewed him and I did this major high school social studies project on Zen Buddhism. And as I say, I just started and I kept up the meditation practice. And then eventually in college, I met a woman from India and my very first semester at university, when I was still 17 years old, I turned 18, uh, that uh, first semester, um, I started the study of Sanskrit and then took up with the study of Tibetan the following year. And I'm glad to hear that Bob Thurman has been part of this uh, gathering and he was a colleague for some years back in the day. But as an undergraduate, studying the arguments for self, studying the arguments against self, I was very curious about incommensurability and was transformed first by close reading and memorization and recitation of Bhagavad Gita and Yoga Sutra and transformed by the seeming contradictions that are not a problem. And when Arjuna asks again and again and again, tell me the right way to do this. And Krishna says, oh, do karma yoga. Oh, but jnana yoga is better. Oh, but bhakti yoga is the best. Oh, but you better meditate. And then as we recited uh, the Yoga Sutra, uh, Yoga Anandashram, 
studied the Sankhikarika very carefully and very intensively under the guidance of a woman from India, Anjali Inti, the founder of the ashram. I was really taken with so many avenues from japa to dream work to reflection on pain and suffering and on the questions and the mitigation of all of those problems, okay, that transformative way of thinking, then all of a sudden, as I read Jain Path of Purification, I said, oh, but there's these people that took Nagarjuna, and we had studied Nagarjuna in Tibetan and Sanskrit, reading them simultaneously, as well as Shantideva, and I said, oh, I love this, taking the four corner negation, which you'll hear about this with Jeff Long in a little bit, and then adding, we can't really give voice to any of this with certainty. So when I went off to do my graduate work, I worked on a text called the Yoga Vasishta which is premised within and using the vocabulary of Yogacara, Chittamatra, Mahayana Buddhism, and marrying it, combining it with a Drishti Shrishti Advaita Vedanta, which means that our perception of things actually creates the world. And it's a beautiful, beautiful text, probably the most elegant Sanskrit that's ever been crafted or so I'm told. And I just spent many years translating shlokas from Yoga Vasishta. And it has that sort of gentleness that I could recognize as I read Coven of Jainis, Jain Path of Purification, and then transporting. So after I read the book, I invited Pavan of Jani to come to Stony Brook. And we got in a big lockdown fight. I was uh, assistant director of the Institute for Advanced Studies of World Religions and had the funding to organize conferences. And I did a major conference, at least it was in our minds, on um, world religions and nonviolence. And Pavan of Jani was there, and his former student, Janet Gatza, was there. And she now is was a colleague at the Institute, along with Bob Thurman. And now she's uh, the Buddhism scholar at uh, Harvard Divinity School. And she just <laughs> let him have it. And she said, Jainism is irrelevant. Jainists are extreme. What good is all of that austerity? And what we were finding enacted right in front of us was the very debates about why the Buddha created the middle path, why the Buddha gave up that very rigorous fast, why the Buddha negotiated constantly with the John merchants for patronage. Many of his recruits came from John families. And here we had the same sort of conversation. And Pavan of Johnny said something that landed within my bones. And he said, Janet, he was very kind. I mean, he had been her professor. But he said, Janet, before you make judgment, or before any of us make judgment, spend time with the Jain sadhus. Spend time with the Jain sadhis. For my second book, and that's where it's transportational, because a few years later, I made good on that, and I've been making good on it ever since. And we're all familiar with the term darshan. And to take darshan from or with a vowed giant monastic can be a very, very transfixing, transformative, and transportational experience. 
So in 1989, I had extended Darshan with the Charya Tulsi, the head of the Terapanti, Svetambara Jain denomination, as well as with Mahapragya and the surviving leader now, Mahashrama. And not only did I have my questions answered about the Gunastanas, but I also was thrown literally, not just in, in the middle of, but front and center as Acharya Tulsi gave blessings to a giant monk Jain nun, rather, in the 28th day of a 40-day final fast. And I came to understand and to truly cherish that pearl of wisdom the Jaini set before us. Before you pass judgment, experience. Okay, don't let your theory get in the way of reality. And from that moment of inspiration and having spent uh, many years researching giant history, reading really everything, I threw out the bibliography, I wished I had published it, but I read everything available in English and French and a bit in German on join uh, scholarship up to that point, and it was a manageable corpus. There were not that many books on Jainism. But Jaini so electrified not only myself, but several other people. And he introduced me to John Court, who was um, the second, uh, Kenneth Folker was the first to really do a PhD on Jainism in America. It was at Harvard in the 1980s, and sadly, he was killed um, by Parr in India. And John Court edited his dissertation, published it, Folkert's dissertation, and then John Court himself did a dissertation that eventually was published um, about John community. And John had given me various pointers of where to go, who to visit, uh, and I went to major giant research centers, including the LD Institute of Indology at, um, affiliated with Gujarat University, and began undertaking the translation of works by Haribhadra, uh, including Yogadrishti Samuchaya, and I'm now wrapping up a multi-year translation of the Yoga Bindu. So what I want to do is not go on too much longer, but I want to just really quickly say there have been dozens of PhD dissertations since uh, about 1985 written with a focus on Jainism. And, and this is, um, again, a little anecdote, but um, an important one, because it has set a template to which really all communities of faith may aspire, but it has also done an amazing service. So this is the deal. We were sitting at the Jain Convention in Schaumburg, Illinois, in I think it was 1994. And the leadership of the Jain community was sitting around the table the Jain Academic Foundation, the Jain Associations in North America. And this was one, the temples were just, like when I came into this, there was only one temple in the whole country. It was in a converted Baptist church in Boston. And then in the late 80s, when I started to get involved, a, set, a small center was built in Buena Park, California, which is now probably 10 times its original size. And we were just sitting around the table back when everything was new and fresh in terms of giants coming to grips with their place within really the American culture. And we were talking about um, universities, we were talking about um, language study, we were talking about the education of children. 
and we were talking about um, the commonality between the Jewish community and the Jain community. Not only do they both start with J, but they both have long history in terms of jewelry. And in fact, for decades, there's been an association in London, more recently in New York, but also in Kobe, Japan, of jewelers in conversation across cultures. And what the Jains, I think, learned from what has allowed the Jewish community to thrive is Hebrew school. And the Patshala, which has now sort of the pizza effect, it's now happening back in India as well. But back in the early 90s, Pravin K. Shah came up with a comprehensive curriculum through which young Jains, meaning from you know, kindergarten to through graduate school and into one's you know, first career, can get together and find out why they're vegetarian, find out the stories of their faith, and find out sort of key vocabulary. So the Pachala was one form, sort of in-house. And then the other was the university. And one thing led to another. And I invited Summonese over in the early O's to come to, I think it was about 2003, a couple of Summonese. One went on to become, become the vice chancellor of John Bishop Authority uh, to study at Loyola Marymount University. And they stayed in touch. And it was mentioned earlier, and, and Mukherand has, as and I have spent a fair amount of time with the Doshi family, but the Doshi family has endowed professorships at UCLA, at Loyola Marymount, at Maharishi International University, and the California Institute for Integral Studies. And the, and the nuns found out about this, and they said, what is this? And I explained how it works about how to approach a university and how to establish a fund that will bring folks to the table. And the very first implementation of a giant professorship was launched at Florida International University by Von Mahavir chair. And the way they designed this is that the summonees teach a couple of classes every year. And then a professor is in place, supported in research and publishing and teaching about the giant faith. So that was the beginning. There are now more than a dozen such arrangements. And this guarantees in perpetuity that Indian philosophy will be part of the curriculum at those universities forevermore. Here in Southern California, Bryn Donaldson, who wrote her PhD on animal welfare in Jainism, is the Jain professor at University of California, Irvine. Anna Bajal, a great philosopher, is the Jain professor at the University of California, Riverside. Claire Mays will soon be joining the California State University at Northridge. In my own university, Christopher Miller holds the Bhagavan Malina professorship for the study of Jain faith and practice. And the list is long. Additionally, if we have an idea, the Jain community is quick to support sponsoring a conference, sponsoring all manner of activities 
that are in support of their mission and their identity and their purpose, which is to make certain that people learn about vegetarianism, to make certain that people learn about multiple perspectives, to make certain that people learn about a value, a greater good beyond the mere accumulation of goods. So with that, I will pause and see if there's any questions and uh, really thank you for your attention. And I know I'm being a little bit, oh, the other thing is that the International Summer School for Giant Studies brings dozens of people from around the world, mainly the United States, to study Jainism in India and have the sort of experience that I had back in 1989. So, um, doing very, very good work there. So, Makarant, do you um, have suggestions about how we proceed? Uh, well, I think I think yeah. it'll be a great idea to take questions, and uh, I'm sure there'll be a few. I'll start with one, if the permits me. Viraji allows. I could ask a question. Thank you. That's Thank you, question. Viraji. And of course, uh, uh, later after Jeff, we want to hear uh, your uh, views on Jan uh, iconography. It's a very important topic. Uh, I also have a few ideas about that. But uh, uh, Chris, one of my questions is about curriculum. You know, uh, the little that I have experienced um, about uh, Jain traditions in India, I visit a couple of Jain gurus. One is a very eminent uh, Digambar guru. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, my question actually comes from my experiences with him. But the preliminary part is that I also have met some Shvetambars and some other uh, uh, sects, so to speak. And this huge divergence of opinions, views. So what is it that we can teach in Jaina studies? How do you... Uh, construct a curriculum, and there's also a danger that the curriculum can homogenize, you know, what is actually a very diverse and open uh, sort of uh, area uh, in practice. So that was my first question. My second question is a little more, uh, should I say, uh, 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 I hesitate to raise it, but it, it comes from a genuine concern because uh, this, this Jain Muni, uh, he's a wonderful person, and, uh, uh, you know, I have been blessed by him. He wears no clothes, and uh, he's an extraordinary person. He has a lot of siddhis also from what happened. His mind is also, it works in a very different fashion. It's like a computer. He'll tell you exactly last year which date uh, you came to meet him, what you were wearing, etc. But I won't go into that. The real difficulty that I had is that, uh, you know, what happened when he fell ill? And then his disciples split into two groups. And one group said, let him die. I mean, I'm putting it crudely and in a very supposedly, should I say, uh, you know, uh, cruel way. But that's exactly how the conflict unfolded. Because they said, it's for his own good that he should die. Otherwise, he'll, he'll return to a very low state from which he has grown through his tremendous tapasya, his ascesis. Because when he goes to a hospital, he won't be able to practice his dharma. Uh, you know, they'll put a tube in him. He has to eat only once. He can only eat what is in his hand. He can only eat it once. And his, his other group, this other group, uh, which was trying to look after him and save his life, you know, the doctor came to see him and he said, look, you have to be, you've got this terrible infection. We'll have to pump you with antibiotics. And then the first group said, you know what? Antibiotics are against Jain Dharma because even the bacteria, you can't kill the bacteria. And by the way, by the way, this went on. And finally, there was a third person, a very important person who was a Hindu, uh, who had nothing to do with these two groups and uh, was also devoted to this uh, Jain Muni. And he was a doctor himself and a friend of mine. One quiet morning, he just took him in an ambulance to the hospital. 
without consulting any of these disciples. And after two or three weeks of hospitalization, the Muni was saved. <coughs> but, but that's not the end of the story. There's a fallout. The fallout is one whole group of people abandoned him completely and also, uh, you know, wrote against him. And uh, the end of the story is even worse in a way that when, when, when this Muni, when, an, when another Muni, not this one, actually was in his last days, the, the group of his disciples, they paraded him, you know, yeah. uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a car, like an open vehicle. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, said that his time has come and they did not, they did not allow anybody to try to save him. And then this other Muni, who is very well known, I won't take any names, I'm sorry. He actually passed away like that in the hands of these people. So I'd like to ask, uh, you know, your views on this as a scholar and as somebody very sympathetic to this tradition as I am myself, because I've benefited tremendously from it. Please. Yeah, first, um, the question about how to teach it without homogenizing. And there's one point of convergence and agreement philosophically that finds textual expression in the Tavarta Sutra of Umasvati. And that provides a ground that formulates without constricting. And I generally will organize my teaching around its premises, which are that there's a life force, that it gets encrusted with karma, that their karma can be um, either encouraged to flow in so that samsara continues or it can be stopped and then expelled leading to freedom. So that formula is a good one in terms of students relating and understanding. And then by looking at art, looking at um, practice, we can put it together and go from there. Now, in terms of the story that you told, it's a very old story. And one of the great scholars of Jainism, Jain literature, Phyllis Granoff, we were at the Lumbini Institute together some years ago, and she shared her latest translation, which was a thousand-year-old story about a giant monk who got sick and all of the, I, I have to call it charades that people had to engage in in order to make sure that he got medical treatment, but that he wasn't getting medical treatment at the same time. So what you shared is something that is um, well known within the tradition. And just as you said, there were people that said, no, it's got to be this way. And then people that said, no, it's got to be this way. Um, the monk in the story eventually did survive. Now, in terms of um, the legal case that, came, that was brought against the Jains for practicing Salekanon. I just published a book a few months ago uh, based on three conferences that we held uh, taking up this topic. And I think most will know, because it was all over the papers, that some years ago in Rajasthan, a case was brought that women were being um, pressured to pass to death and that this practice must stop. And it went to the Indian Supreme Court who put a stay on it and it supposedly will be taken up again at some point or another. But um, this again is a practice that when I first learned about it, when I was first literally put in the midst of it, there was a voice that said, you know, her physician was there. He had a white coat and a stethoscope. And I said, why doesn't he give her an IV? You know, I mean, I didn't say that, but that was, you know, my sort of conditioning was that if someone's sick, and then it made me really think, 
And I hadn't lost anybody to that point. And I came back to Los Angeles and we had a very famous basketball team. And I taught pretty much everybody on that basketball team, including a young man called Hank Gathers. And Hank Gathers at the conference playoffs and our, on our campus died of a heart attack while playing basketball. And it was the first time in my adult awareness that anybody had ever really died that I knew. And, you know, I was still in my, well, mid thirties. And then shortly thereafter, my best friend passed away. Another very close friend passed away. My wife's sister passed away all within six months, exactly 30 years ago. And in the case of the two who died of illness, I was able to share the story of that child nun. And they made end of life decisions that included do not resuscitate, do not hydrate when they had crossed a certain threshold. And they died peacefully. They died in a way that brought peace to their family. And I know that JNU is right next to Kundakunda Bharat, which is where um, Acharya Vidyananda, who I'm sure you've taken darshan with, passed. I was living there um, in the Haskas village in 2019 and attended the spectacle of his passing. And I'd never seen anything quite like it. He was a very famous figure, had many, many disciples, beautiful campus there in South Delhi, sort of between IIT Delhi and JNU. And there were just thousands of people every day coming to take his darshan as he's passing away. And on the one hand, I, you know, appreciate it the sincerity of sentiment, but on the other hand, it was a spectacle. And um, again, I didn't say in the back of my head, you know, put an IV in because I'd seen him and over the course of many years and then seen his gradual decline and he was well into his nineties. Um, and I think it's good for our sensibilities to be shaken once in a while. And I appreciate just as a human being when I encounter something that I can't figure out. And again, with the monk who had fallen I would probably said, yeah, I think the antibiotic is necessary because we do make decisions and we have to weigh what is the greater good, what is the, the, the greater harm. And the good done by Amuni is worthy of protection. And I love how you sort of staged it as uh, the middle path. Like it wasn't those people, it wasn't like, it was something totally different. And it reminds me of um, one of the great ways that Jainism, Jain faith, Jain practice has transformed America. And we're in the midst of it constantly every day. Uh, my, uh, my wife and I were listening earlier to Angela Davis, who was giving a workshop on Zoom. And um, James Lawson objected to the Korean War. And when he was released from prison for refusing to serve in the military in the 1950s, he traveled to India, taught school for three years, and learned from the folks 
at Sevagram Ashram. Learned from Vinoba Bhave, learned direct action for change. And he went back and he trained Martin Luther King Jr. He trained Rosa Parks. He trained John Lewis. And America continues to struggle. And when one of the folks from that circle, James Lawson still teaches in his 90s now, but one of his colleagues, Glenn Smiley, put it this way, and I love the story that Makaranda told. He said, nonviolence isn't about just being passive. Nonviolence requires that we do the unexpected. And your friend who saved the Jain Muni did exactly that. And that's what the Jains challenge me to do is to never assume and to be willing to think about things, to look at things, to take action in ways that are unexpected. So that's all. Thank you so much, Professor Zafir. As uh, you said, contradictions are not a problem. So that makes <laughs> total sense. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Professor Jain, do you have some comments? Maybe there are a few, a few questions for Professor Chaplin. So before we move on to that, do you want to comment something? I think I would like to invite other people. I've been talking to asking questions to Professor Chaplin for the last 20 years. <laughs> Or 15 years, I think. So it's other stuff yes. now. Other stuff now. Yeah, yes, please. yes. Uh, Mr. Anand Giri, you had some questions. So if you could just unmute yourself and ask questions. Good morning, Chris. Lovely to see you. Hello, Anand. And good morning, uh, dear uh, Makran, uh, Pankaj, and Dr. Biraj. Now, moving from this very difficult conversation, one of the main thrust of your engagement this morning, join us study with the global academia. You mentioned about uh, the communication between the Jews and the giants. Uh, you know, but uh, along with the jewelry communication, what is the challenge of dialogue or mutual study and what can be called as confrontative dialogue? For example, certain aspect of uh, Jewish cultures and Jewish philosophy and Jaina philosophy. But that is just a starting point for the kind of interreligious, transreligious, and transphilosophical dialogue that Jaina studies in the global academia is uh, kind of called for. So it is in that spirit, you know, that how do we look at possible kind of dialogue? between say Anekanta Bada, of course there is a lecture on this next, and and the middle path, because the Anekanta Bada, as it is a practice of uh, the multiple perspective, and of course the next lecture is on practical Anekanta Bada, the point is what are the possible kind of ways of understanding Anekanta as possibly preparing the ground for some kind of middle path. But in terms of modern philosophical dialogue, I would also request to reflect upon what might be a possible dialogue between, say, Joino epistemology and Edmund Husserl's phenomenology. For example, when Husserl talks about overlapping content and the whole Jaina, you know, ontology and epistemology of Anekantabhata. So the point is the challenge of transreligious and cross philosophical dialogue and requires much more than just join a study. Yeah, I'd like to respond by first talking about orthopraxy, that although it's different foods, both 
Jain communities and Jewish communities define themselves by the foods they eat. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. The second thing, which allows for the possibility of even a conversation with Husserl and perspectivalism, the second thing is literacy. And just as in the Jewish community, young children go to Hebrew school to learn their Torah portion, and Jews are worldwide 110% literate. So also, and in part due to minority status, Jains have to learn what to do and why they do it. And again, I don't know if it's 110, but it's probably 105% literacy within the Jain community. So this is sort of the base, is that there has to be a commitment to lifestyle and there has to be a commitment to the life of the mind. And those two provide fertile ground for conversation because already you're in a realm of discourse and already you're invested in, in the case of Jain's a vegetarian lifestyle, and the case of Jewish communities somewhere on the continuum of kosher. And these are fundamentally interesting and in and of themselves provoke conversations about what is the best way to think, what is the best way to live. And your point about the jewelry, especially diamond trading across the world, uh, Belgium, Antwerp is another center where Jews and Jans have been working together for, for decades. Yes, yes, yes. There's been some good studies of that. Right, right. It's Mark. Yes. May I add a word? Yes, please, yes, please. I hope you hear me. I. Um, as you know, I am uh, trying to take further the Hindu-Jewish uh, dialogue, and we have our latest volume, Dharma and uh, Halakha, co-edited with Judith Greenberg. So we have there a chapter by Aaron Gross about Jewish and Jain dietary habits. So exactly yes. the point uh, you made, but this uh, Jain-Jewish dialogue is underdeveloped. There's much room to develop that in uh, various ways, but uh, it's undeveloped yet. It Hopefully that will be uh, also. That's all. Thank you, Professor Theodore. Uh, are there any other questions? If others would like to ask any questions, please raise your hand, or you could type the questions in the chat room, chat box. Yes. Please go ahead. Thank you. Just wanted to inquire if not being able to live in its cultural traditions and history, would Indic learning from outside be effective? That's the question. Could you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, if not being able to live in its cultural traditions and history, would Indic learning from outside be effective? Uh, okay. Yeah, I think that. Um, certainly in the American context, um, going back to one of the um, really shapers of um, sort of the American ethos, if we look at the transmission from um, Emerson and Thoreau to William James to Alfred North Whitehead to the founders, to Abraham Maslow and the founders of the, the uh, modern American psychotherapeutic movement, 
uh, that we see that so much of the Indian sensibility has really been part of the warp and woof of what it means to be an American. And the whole concept of freedom is in many ways resonant with the Indian concept of moksha and even the Buddhist concept of nirvana and this yearning for a sense of relationship with the transcendent is a very American way of engaging the world. So one might think that no, American culture is different from Indian culture, but I'm not really quite so sure. And part of it is just, um, you know, probably my own circumstance. Uh, but having lived in India, having lived in America, having spent a great deal of time in Europe, um, I am not so certain that humans are really all that different one from another. And that these ideas, I mean, the big ideas, are we in charge of our destiny? Okay, every culture asks that idea. The idea that, oh, food is important. Yeah, every culture values food in its own way. And in America, where we have people really from all over the world living in one place next to one another, uh, there is a real reluctance um, to dismiss um, truth wherever it can be found. So I know it's not the America that hits the papers. I know it's not the America of Hollywood, but um, but I'd like to to think that uh, there's a shared human project that transcends culture. Thank you, Professor Chapman. So there is just one question from uh, Smita Srinivas, which even I want to ask to an extent. So she's asking, would you suggest ties of uh, joint university bridges across the US uh, that are built into and practice as scholars? And in a way, trying to bridge this gap between theory and practice uh, and build that into curricula. Uh, what would you suggest uh, for that? Uh, I've been reflecting on this and really taking action for so many years. And the good thing is that through the American Institute of India Studies, there is really a robust um, group of scholars. I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Americans who, through the Fulbright, through the American Institute for India Studies, have been in India, have you know learned the languages, are actively teaching, and our university systems are so very different. And partly inspired by William James, the idea of the American college and the American university is that we seek to let people explore, to let people find out who they are, and we have virtually at all places of higher learning, a liberal arts requirement so that everybody has to study science, everybody has to study math, everybody has to study literature, everybody has to study philosophy. And at a place like my own, everybody has to study religions. And we are in it a lot longer. We go to college a little bit later and we stay longer. We go for four years and we take this very broad curriculum. And in India, now I know Ashok University is switching it out a little bit, but my heart sank uh, many years ago when the exams came out and depending upon where you placed on the exam, you went to medical school or you went to engineering school I mean, when you're 16 years old and you don't study anything else, and if you don't, if you're not a good student, then you study philosophy. And I was like, oh, this is so sad. 
So I'm hoping that places like Ashoka University are beginning to make a little bit of a difference. And what we've been doing for years is um, exchange of scholars. Um, because of monetary differences, it's a little bit more difficult for Indian students to come to the United States on, say, an exchange. But with so many families now having a foothold in both countries, there's, you know, it's doing well. Um, so, um, yeah, I, yeah, and, okay, so I do want to re respond to this from uh, Dhananjay Tripathi. Population of giants is reduced, um, and very high literacy. Um, it really depends upon who's doing the census, and the minority status was um, highly political. I followed it, and again, I, um, India is a very complicated place that I, I don't easily understand. Um, but um, I'm not too worried about the seeming population decline. And it reminds me of the Parsis and the Zoroastrians. Um, of course, everyone's known for decades now that, oh no, the last Parsi is going to die. And then something happened. Um, they discovered that in what's now the country of Azerbaijan, that a whole bunch of Zoroastrians had been living within the old Soviet Union, and it just opened possibilities that were not available uh, before when this unknown population came to be known to the world. And it really depends upon who's doing the counting. Um, but given the tenacity of um, the tradition in terms of educating its youth, I'm, I'm not really too worried about the longevity of, of giant, uh, giant faith and practice. Thank you so much, Professor Tapper. Just to add uh, to your previous point, at Flame University also we do uh, exactly similar to what American universities and Ashoka universities do. So ours is also a liberal arts program. And we are also a minority joint institution. So we you know, introduce our students to a lot of different kinds of uh, courses and hopefully Professor Jain also will be able to, to teach that. Uh, are there any other questions? I just have a few comments. Uh, are there any other questions for Professor Chapel? So, oh, I think we're good, Professor Shah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. I just wanted to make a few comments and thank you so much for this uh, lecture. And this is something which you know, I've been also thinking about. And uh, I'm, I mean, as you rightly pointed out, there was when I started my PhD, there was a paucity of you know material. And while you rightly pointed out, there are a lot of programs, a lot of uh, you know new look, it's a study centers being you know set up, but the focus still is on Jain philosophy and on Jain text, which of course very much required, but not so much focus on. Uh, Jain or you know, for that matter, Jain architecture or Jain iconographic traditions, or of course, Professor John Cott, you know, deals with a little bit of facts and practices and rituals. But when it comes to Jain art, uh, you know, there is this kind of an absence uh, in the curricula. Also, right from the colonial time, you know, there was focus on Buddhist studies, on Buddhist art, mm -hmm. but there was hardly any focus on Jain art. And even today, uh, if you look at the textbooks or even the academic reference books, there's hardly any focus on, uh, and nothing is taught on Jain art at all. I mean, I didn't learn anything in my uh, postgraduate program. So that is something I think we need to build into our curricula with more focus on that. Of course, keeping in mind the interconnectedness of this whole entire Indian art. So while when I say Jain art and uh, architecture, of course, uh, keeping in mind the common regional art idiom, which was followed, you know, in different uh, different times and different regions, but at the same time, some kind of focus, you know, on the undergrad and the graduate studies program on Jain uh -huh. art uh, would really you know, help uh, to get some kind of focus. So when it comes to Indian scholars, there is really a dearth of Indian scholars who are working on this aspect of Jain studies, which is also extremely important. 
and very, very valuable part of you know, Indian heritage. So I hope, you know, if, you know, there's some kind of uh, progress in, in this direction. But of course, as you rightly pointed out, there's definitely much, much more awareness about philosophy and text. So when I teach uh, iconography classes or when I teach, you know, a lot of other uh, in other institutes on Jainism, philosophy they are aware of, but they have absolutely no clue about uh, Jain temples or Jain caves or Jain iconography. So I think, you know, we, we need to work uh, uh, on those aspects. But mm -hmm. thank you so much for this uh, uh, this uh, lecture. Uh, would you like to comment anything? Yes, I'd like to um, talk about the Peaceful Liberators. And um, more than 20 years ago, um, our local, very esteemed Pratap Paul put together, with support from the Jain community, significant financial support, the first major museum exhibit on Jain art, and that it traveled the world. It went to Victoria and Albert. It went to the New Orleans Museum of Art. The catalog is simply stunning. And my own professor of Sanskrit, Jose Pereira, uh, wrote a very early art historical study of Jain faith. And he was the one who identified that at the base of the, the Bahubali statue, it's actually Konkani inscription. And as a Goan, he was quite thrilled to sort of see that cultural presence down there. But um, there is much to be done. And if you go to the National Museum, there's a whole lot more Tirtankaras than there are Buddhas even. And uh, Natura, the very first image of a meditating figure was a jinna. And then the other piece, uh, the museum in Bidisha, uh, close to Bhopal. If you've not been there, it is absolutely exquisite. And it's just filled with this great Indus Valley material, as well as um, images of Tirtankaras, both in Kayot Sarga and in Padmasana, in all different, very creative arrays. So you're, I'm so happy that you're taking up the study of the archaeology, and there are just so many wonderful, wonderful sites to explore in all parts of India. And I've been blessed to be able to, to visit many, but there's so many hundreds and hundreds. Yeah, Makaran. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to come in on this because I think there's a, a really important issue in terms of understanding these, uh, you know, gigantic images, you know, of uh, magnificent images of the Tirthankars, you know, not only the image at, uh, I think, Shravana Belagola, you know, uh, but uh, elsewhere. And I had uh, this uh, interesting conversation with Professor Harsh, the Heja, who said that uh, the primary purpose of uh, Indian art, traditional art, pre-modern art, was to recreate uh, the uh, image or the idea of that limitless Purusha who connects all the worlds, you know, uh, and with his thousand arms and thousand eyes and thousand hands. And, uh, you know, all these magnificent images, uh, whether they are Shakta, when, when you have an image of Kali like that, or an image of Mahavishnu like that, or of the Buddha, and then of the Tirthankars, you see, they're all images of wholeness, the wholeness of the cosmos, the interconnectedness of all levels of life, and how that's, that consciousness permeates every, everything and everyone. Now, the real challenge is, the, and, and then, you know, you go to Dilwara and Mount Abu and all, you know, the, the carvings are so extraordinary. I mean, uh, and, and it's like Mount Meru. It's a, it's a, it's a layered, uh, you know, in a, say, uh, in a sense, instantiation of that, uh, uh, you know, uh, that primal world. And, uh, Rishab, Rishab Nath is supposed to have uh, been in Kailash also. So these are all interlinked, and Kailash itself is a symbol, like the like the pyramids are. So there's a lot 
that uh, that remains to be explored is what I'm saying, especially in the interconnectedness of these uh, Sanatani, co-Sanatani uh, art traditions and what they were trying to accomplish. Uh, because there's no verisimilitude, you know, you can't say, uh, unless you look at the, you know, if you look at Shantinath, you'll see a deer. So there are those telltale uh, identifications. But if you see the face, the, there's no verisimilitude. I mean, there's no modern notion of being true to, uh, true to, uh, you know, any kind of uh, identifiable physical attributes of an individual. It's really the ideal archetype that is being uh, re-emphasized over and over again. But I think we are a little bit behind time and we should uh, maybe uh, get back to this conversation after listening to Jeff. Yes, you're right. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Chappell, once again. Uh, now we'll have a recorded talk uh, uh, by Professor uh, Jeffrey Long. Uh, Professor Jeffrey Long's talk is on practical anekantuvat, a Jain contribution to global civilization. Uh, Professor Jeffrey Long is the Carl Zeigler Professor of Religion and Philosophy at Elizabethtown College, Pennsylvania, where he has taught since receiving his doctoral degree from the University of Chicago Divinity School. Uh, in 2013, Dr. Long gave the inaugural Virchand Gandhi Lecture in Jain Studies at Claremont University. Uh, in 2018, he received the Hindu American Foundation's Dharma Seva Award for his ongoing work to promote accurate and culturally sensitive portrayals of Indian traditions in American education system and popular media. Uh, Dr. Long has also given three presentations in the United Nations uh, in 2019. So can we have uh, Professor Long's uh, lecture, please? Yes, I will uh, share the screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Little different from the rooms. Let me figure out how to do it. One second. Uh, system analysts, if you're there, can you just guide us through this? Okay, done. It's happening. Good. Mm -hmm. Is it? Uh, No sound, the image is coming through. There's no sound. So just just close the video. Just so Gaurav here. Yeah. So just close the video. Okay. Uh close the screen also. And uh, close the sharing also. Okay. Just open that video in your computer. Minimize the Cisco WebEx and open that video on your computer. Okay. Okay. Now uh, start sharing. Now share the video. Can you see it now? Yeah, I okay. We can see it, no, but, but we can't no, hear it. We, we can't hear it exactly. So you have to play the video. You have to play the video. After that, you have to share it. So you play it and play it so that you can hear the sound and then share it. Yeah, I'm able to hear it clearly. Um, um, uh... If I if I may, Gaurav, I think uh, Professor Jain will have to share his audio. So there is a uh, Professor Jain. There will be one uh, sign saying, "Share the computer audio." When you share the screen, there will be below that there will be one particular sign which says, "Share the audio." Okay. Mm -hmm. On the on the left side of your screen, left side, share okay. audio. If I can, sorry. 
This is totally new for me. Oh, sure. So, when you share screen, there will be an option. There will be option uh, share audio also on the left side of your screen. Share screen करने से पहले. गौरव जी हमारा चल रहा है कि नहीं अभी नहीं चला. Sir, uh, नहीं सर अभी नहीं चला है सर. Share content, share web browser, share my meeting window. I don't see share audio. Uh, sir, first play the video. Sir, first play the video. Just uh, okay. cancel video everything. No, no, you are sharing the video. Just play the video on your laptop. That's it. Close everything. Yeah. Close sharing. Close sharing also. The screen sharing also. Okay. Exactly. Now play the video. Is it playing on your system? Is it working yes. on your system? Just yes. minimize, uh, pause it, pause it. Now go to share button. Hmm? Go to share on your uh, Cisco WebEx meetings. Share, yeah. And now share that video, only video, not screen. Give me one minute, sir. one minute. Sir. Share movies and TV option is there and then share screen is option is there. Let me try now. Difference uh, between uh, where I live on the East Coast of the U.S. and it's India. Uh, but uh, I'm very happy that I've had the opportunity to record my presentation so that you can we hear can it. We can only hear. We can't see any anything. questions or comments. Look, anyone might want to show share. Show us the video, sir. Um, great, 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 uh, great. Happy to share my uh, contact information. I believe the organizers of the conference have that. Um, but I will go ahead Lost and proceed again. Uh, with my talk. So I'm going to share my screen. And my presentation is called we've lost the screen. That is applying the Jain philosophy of yeah, infinite yeah, diversity. Great. Okay, great, so good. I want to say a, a bit about what I mean here by practical anekantavad. This will become more evident as uh, we get uh, through the presentation. But uh, anekantavad is a, a Jain doctrine, uh, a Jain teaching about the nature of existence. Connected closely with it are teachings about the nature of knowledge and teachings about how we ought to best express our knowledge and how we ought to best express our understanding of reality, particularly when we're engaged with conversations with people of differing worldviews and differing backgrounds. So I'm going to say quite a lot about this particular doctrine, how it emerged, its history in the context of Jain thought and Jain intellectual history. But then I want to talk about its applications in our contemporary world as well. And uh, I've uh, really sort of paraphrased or borrowed from Swami Vivekananda, uh, his term practical Vedanta. Uh, his aim also was to make the ancient teaching of Vedanta relevant for his time, for our time, for the modern world and to show how this was a very practical philosophy and not only something abstract, not only a set of abstract ideas. And so in the same way, I want to argue that Anikantavad is also a very practical philosophy that has a lot of relevance to our contemporary situation. And so I want to uh, unpack for you what Anikantavad is and then discuss its application. So, Anikantavada is one of three doctrines, three teachings, which uh, I refer to as the Jain doctrines of relativity. 
I want to quickly explain what I mean by relativity. I'm borrowing here, of course, from uh, Einstein uh, and from physics, uh, and uh, not in a very detailed technical sense, but in a very broad sense that we know that there are certain aspects of the universe uh, and certain claims that we can make whose truth is relative, that is, whose truth is dependent upon context, upon a host of factors. And of course, when Einstein talks about relativity, one of the things that he talks about, for example, is the relationship between time and velocity and the fact that time uh, is uh, measured differently. It, it, it seems to slow down uh, the closer you get to the speed of light. So someone might go on a journey to another star system and come back, and for them, only maybe one month has passed. They return to Earth and find 100 years have passed on Earth. And who is right? The person for whom it was one month or the person for whom it was 100 years? Well, they're both correct because those that time dilation is an effect of the speed at which one is traveling. And if you're traveling at speed, that is time for you. And so uh, in the same way, if, if we look at philosophy, we can also see that many of the truths that we cling to, many of the ideas that are foundational to our worldviews, whatever they may be, are also relative. They also are dependent upon context and upon a whole host of factors. And the Jain tradition has understood this from a very early period. Uh, the three doctrines that really capture this idea, first is Anikantavada. This is a metaphysical or ontological claim, uh, a view about the nature of reality itself. The claim at its most basic is that reality is anekanta, that is, it is non-one-sided, or you could say it is multiplex or multifaceted or complex. Reality is complex. There are a variety of types of being that we encounter in the universe, and there are a variety of modes of knowing those entities, which just gets it, that gets us into the second doctrine, nayavada, this is the doctrine of nayas, that is, perspectives. This is an epistemological claim, a claim about the nature of knowledge, and it is the claim that each aspect of reality that is affirmed in Anikantavada corresponds to a perspective from which it can be viewed. In other words, Anikantavada claims reality is complex, so imagine, let's say, a multifaceted diamond. And... You, if you're looking at that diamond, you can see one facet that's facing you. Maybe you can see some of the other facets along the side. You can't see the facet on the other side, right? You, you can only see the side of the diamond that you're facing. So your ability to know and comprehend that diamond is conditioned by what you're able to access, what you're able to perceive. So each aspect of reality, each facet of the diamond corresponds to a perspective from which it can be viewed. One person is going to see this facet. Someone sitting on the other side of the diamond will see another facet, and so on. Then we come to Syadvada. This is a doctrine about how to speak on the basis of Anikantavada and Nayavada. Claims are true in some sense or in a certain respect or from a certain perspective. In other words, you can't just say the diamond is blue, for example. Maybe the facet that's facing you is blue. Maybe someone who's viewing it from the other side uh, sees red. And they say, no, it looks red to me. And uh, you're both perceiving. Uh, you're both in relation to the same reality. So rather than say that one of you is right and one of you is wrong, according to Syadvada, if we conditionalize our statements, if we say, well, from my perspective, as I see it looking at this facet, the diamond is blue. The diamond is blue in this sense and in this respect. Then that's a true statement. And it does not interfere with the opposite claim, where the diamond is red uh, or the diamond is green or whatever it might be. Uh, these don't have to interfere with one another because they're relating to different aspects of a complex reality. So the idea is just about any philosophical topic we want to look at can be seen from many perspectives. Each topic has many facets. And whatever we say about that topic, it, the truth of, the, of our statements will be conditioned by the perspective from which we are operating. A wonderful parable that's frequently used in the Jain tradition, and in fact, uh, there are Buddhist and Hindu variations of this parable as well, is the parable of the blind men and the elephant. You see a group of blind men, and they're all feeling a different part of the elephant. They've come upon this creature, and they've been asked to describe it. 
And so you see on the left, there's a man feeling the trunk. And near him, there's another man feeling the tusks. Someone else is feeling the ear, another one's feeling a leg, another feeling the side, another feeling the tail. And so when each man is asked, describe the elephant, uh, they say different things. The person handling the trunk says, this feels kind of like a large snake. Someone feeling the side of the elephant might say, doesn't feel like a snake, it really feels more like a, a wall. Someone else grasping the, the leg might say, it's like a pillar or a column. And they'll hear each other's descriptions and they'll find those descriptions don't match with their experience. So they'll start to argue. And this is what happens in the story. The blind men start to argue and fight about the nature of the elephant. Finally, someone who can see the, the whole elephant has mercy on them and explains an elephant is actually all of these things. You're all partially correct. Each of you is accurately describing the part of the elephant that you've experienced, that you've felt, but you're also incorrect if you deny the validity of the other claims being made because those are all based on the experiences of those people. And in fact, an elephant has a part that is like a snake and a part that is like a column and a part that is like a wall, etc. And so harmony can exist even though the substantive claims being made differ but they're being made about different facets of reality. So they can coexist without anyone having to be completely wrong or anyone really being completely right because uh, they have no one has experienced the whole elephant. And if you think about it, even the person who can see uh, is only seeing one side of the elephant. What's on the other side of this picture, right? Uh, maybe we can say only the elephant knows the elephant in its fullness. And maybe, uh, to, to paraphrase the, the, the Rig Veda, maybe even the elephant knows not, right? Uh, it, it, reality is vast and complex and beyond the comprehension of a finite mind. So how did these Jain doctrines originate? Uh, how is it that Jains began viewing reality in this way? Uh, so one likely source for the, these Jain doctrines of relativity, Anikantavada, Nayavada, and Syadvada, was Mahavira's approach to questions about reality with contrary answers, the famous avyakta or unanswerable questions to which the Buddha often responded with silence. Mahavira, of course, is the 24th Tirthankar, the 24th enlightened teacher of the Jain tradition. Uh, according to Jain teaching in any given kalpa, in any given cosmic cycle, there are 24 Tirthankars that appear in a particular world, in a particular world space. In our world, Mahavira is the 24th. As a historical figure, he's believed to have lived around the 6th century before the Common Era, uh, roughly around the same time as the Buddha, uh, slightly older contemporary of the Buddha. And if you look at the Jain Agamas, the, the Jain uh, scriptures uh, that uh, record Mahavir's teaching, uh, they are from a very similar environment and similar milieu uh, as the Pali canon of Buddhism. Because uh, as far as the historical record can, can show, Mahavir lived around what is now Bihar, eastern Uttar Pradesh, that region, roughly the same region where uh, the Buddha lived. And uh, so it was a similar environment. And uh, both Mahavir and Buddha were uh, renouncers. Uh, they had followers, and those followers went on and developed a tradition out of their teachings. So during the time of Mahavir and Buddha, there was a set of questions that were considered unanswerable. That is, uh, one could posit answers to them, but there was a great deal of debate about them. And uh, it was often, there was also often a lot of skepticism. People did not always believe one could actually know the answers to these questions. Uh, just a couple of examples, uh, the universe and <clears throat> the soul, the jiva, um, the uh, living essence of a being. Uh, are these eternal? <clears throat> excuse me, or are they non-eternal? That is, uh, has the universe always existed and, and will it always exist? Has the soul always existed? Will it always exist? These were things that were debated among various darshanas, various uh, systems of philosophy, different worldviews in ancient India. Um, so Mahavir took what you could call a both and approach to these questions. That is, some would say the universe is eternal. It has always existed, it will always exist. Others will say no. They say it was created, it emerged at a certain time, it will pass away at a certain time. Similarly with the soul or the essence of a living being, some would say that 
we have always existed, right? Bhagavad Gita teaches we've always existed and we will always exist. And then others said, well, no, uh, there's the body, it's born, it lives, it dies, and that is, that's the person, and so, no, it's not eternal. So these would be debated a great deal. And Mahavira would take, in a sense, both sides of the argument and say, well, in a certain sense, this view is correct, and in, a, in another sense, this other view is correct. So this is a nice uh, quotation from a, a translation of the Bhagavati Sutra. This is from the uh, Jain Agamas, um, the, the Shvetambara Agamas. The Venerable Mahavira told his disciple, the Bhikkhu Jamali, thus, the world is Jamali eternal. It did not cease to exist at any time. It was, it is, and it will be. It is constant, permanent, eternal, imperishable, indestructible, and always existent. The world is Jamali non-eternal, for it becomes progressive in time cycle after being regressive, and it becomes regressive after becoming progressive. The soul is Jamali eternal, for it did not cease to exist at any time. The soul is Jamali non-eternal, for it becomes animal after being a hellish creature, becomes a man after becoming an animal, and it becomes a god after being a man. And so you see here in what Mahavir is saying that he's taking the possible answers to these questions and situating them within the larger context of the Jain worldview. So the world is eternal in the sense that it has always existed and it will always exist. It's, it's uh, imperishable. However, according to Jain teaching, the world does not remain the same. The world changes from moment to moment. And over vast cycles of time, it changes a great deal. There's something called the Utsarpani, that is the progressive uh, scale of time in which things improve in the universe. And there's a regressive cycle, the Avasarpani, where things decline. And so the universe goes through these cycles of progression and decline, and it changes. And it's, it's really, you could say, not the same universe from era to era. So in that sense, it's not eternal. This particular universe, if by that we mean this existing scenario right now, that is not eternal. That will pass away. It will not come back. A new cycle will come. Something else will happen. Things will change. Same with the soul. The soul has always existed and will always exist. It never ceased to be, right? Again, the Gita's doctrine as well. However, if by the soul we're talking about the person as they are at a certain stage, at a certain point in time, well, that changes also constantly. Even within one lifetime, our physical body changes a great deal. I often ask my students, you know, what were you like 20 years ago? Well, many of them weren't born yet, or they were babies or small children. Now they're young people. Someday they'll be elderly people. They change. And then if you extend that through many lifetimes, in one lifetime you might be a dog, in one lifetime you might be a rabbit, in one lifetime you might be a human being, and so on. And so we change. Therefore, the soul is not the same. It's not, in, in one sense, the same soul, even from moment to moment, because if by soul we're referring to the entire state of being, then uh, no, that's that's going to change. So you can see that Mahavira is casting the Jain worldview as this vast field of possibility in which all of the different answers to these questions could be in some sense true and in some sense false. The Jain both and approach to ultimate questions is presented by later Jain authors as a kind of middle path, intellectual middle path, between Buddhist and Hindu metaphysical views based on ideas of impermanence and permanence, respectively. If you know much about Buddhist philosophy, you know that one of the key teachings of Buddhism is that reality is constantly changing. It is anitya, right? This is the first noble truth, sarva manityam, all is impermanent. In Hindu traditions like Vedanta, uh, you have an emphasis on Brahman, which is unchanging. In views like Nyaya, there is talk of dravyas or substances which don't change. Uh, they're basically permanent features of the universe. And this Jain view that there is both a changing and an unchanging aspect of reality is a way of bringing those together. Say, so, well, the Buddhists are right when, when you're talking about the modalities through which a being goes through time. Yes, those are all impermanent. But the various Hindu traditions uh, also are correct. They're looking at what is continuous through all the various phases of time. 
So they're both right, right? So this is a kind of Jane way to, to moderate any potential conflict between these varied views and also to present the Jane worldview as capable of integrating both. According to the scholar Pyotr Batserovitz, uh, it's also possible that the Jane doctrines of relativity emerged from out of Jane ascetic discourse about which entities are living and which are not. This discourse is vital to the practice of ahinsa or nonviolence in thought, word, and deed, taking care that one is not inadvertently destroying small life forms. So according to Balsarowitz's research, uh, there, are, there are early Jane texts and early Jane conversations about you know, when you're moving about in the world and when, when you're looking at various, especially very small entities, how do you determine what is living and what is not? Because if something's alive, you need to be very careful around it and not accidentally destroy it. And some entities may be ambiguous. Um, is it alive? Is it not alive? Well, you could say in one sense it is, in one sense it's not. Um, think about plants, for example. Uh, they are, for the most part, inanimate, yet they have life. So how should they be treated? And these kinds of questions about nonviolence are one possible source from which this system of philosophy came. The Jain doctrines of relativity can also be seen as logically following from the Jain conception of reality as irreducibly pluralistic. That is, from a Jain point of view, uh, reality is made up of different types of entity, and those differences never really dissolve, right? This is somewhat different from, for example, Advaita Vedanta, where all, everything ultimately is Brahman, right? Everything ultimately is one, and plurality, diversity is an effect of Maya. Uh, from a Jain point of view, plurality, diversity are, are real things, and they are not uh, one type of entity is not reducible to another. According to traditional Jain ontology, the cosmos is made up of six basic types of substance, dravya or astikaya, as they're also called. The substances are not reducible to one another or to any further seventh element, right? There's not some kind of super substance that subsumes them in Jain thought, kind of like Brahman and Vedanta. So what are the elements? There is the jiva, the soul, or life force, pudgala, that is non-living matter, dharma, which means the same things it means uh, in Jainism that it, that it means in Hindu traditions about a way of life and virtues and ethics. But in Jain metaphysics, dharma also refers to the principle of motion. What is it that makes motion possible? And adharma, the principle of inertia. In fact, you could see parallels maybe between the Jain idea of dharma and the guna of rajas in the Sankhya school of thought. It's a dynamic principle, whereas adharma would be more like tamas, kind of an, a principle in, of inertia. You have akash, that is space, and then kala, time. Finally, relativity can also be seen as following logically from the Jain understanding of the soul as having both an unchanging basic nature, its dravya, and changing qualities, gunas, and modes or paryayas uh, that all arise from karma. So this is very similar to what Mahavira was saying earlier about the soul being both eternal and non-eternal, has an eternal dravya and changing gunas and paryayas. This shapes the Jain understanding of the nature of a real entity as being characterized by arising, perishing, and endurance. And this is the classic definition of a real entity that's given in the uh, Jain text, the Tattvata Sutra of Umaswati, who lived sometime from the first to third centuries uh, of the common era. Uh, the 29th verse of the fifth chapter of the Tattvata Sutra is Utpada Vyayava Dravya Yuktam Sat, or being Sat is that which undergoes arising, Utpada, perishing, Vyayava, and endurance through time, Dravya. Uh, it is Yuktam, yoked or linked to these three qualities. So a being arises, it exists for a period of time, it passes away. This is the Jain understanding of the nature of the soul. How does this connect with relativity? Because our questions about the nature of reality includes things like, are they eternal? Are they non-eternal? And here you see this ability to incorporate both. So complexity is introduced into the system. As we saw with the idea of the six dravyas, there's more complexity in the system. Are you talking from the perspective of the principle of motion? Are you talking from the perspective of time, from the perspective of space, from the perspective of a soul, from the perspective of non-living matter, and so on. So you have this complex picture of reality, and so the Anikant idea arises very naturally from that. So how did these ideas develop later on? 
Okay, the Tatvarta Sutras are relatively early text, early in the Common Era. It's also the one text that the, the two main schools of Jainism, the Shvetambara and the Degamara, agree upon. So the basic conception of reality in the Tatvarta Sutra is pretty uniformly held across the Jain tradition. So Jain authors of the period uh, beyond this, from roughly the 5th century to the 7th, 17th century, a uh, long period of time, uh, further developed the basic idea of relativity that emerges from the Jain Agamas and the Tatvata Sutra. Digambara Jain thinkers such as Kunda Kunda, Siddhasena Divakara, and Samantabhadra, as well as Shvetambara thinkers such as Hari Badrasuri and Yashovijya, developed a distinctively Jain approach to the concept of philosophical difference. So it's from the works of these various authors that I've been generalizing everything I've been saying about Anekantavada, Nayavada, and Syadvada. And I'm going to continue in that vein. Just a quick review, Anekantavada again is the idea that reality is inherently complex. This eventually develops into the idea that every entity has potentially infinite facets or dimensions. Nayavada is an epistemological doctrine that corresponds with Anekantavada. Every facet of an entity corresponds to a perspective from which it can be viewed and from which true statements can be made about it, which brings us to Syadvada, a doctrine about how truth is expressed in sentences. According to this doctrine, a metaphysical claim is true syat, that is, from a certain point of view. From other points of view, it may be false, it may be both true and false, and so on. We're going to see the different levels of truth that are possible according to Syadvada. In Sanskrit, syat normally uh, is a form of the verb be or us, which means uh, it may be, it could be. But in Jain technical usage, it, it doesn't really mean maybe, it means in a certain sense, like it, it is definitely such and such from a certain perspective, but not from all perspectives. So, uh, as I just mentioned, there are different levels of truth according to Syadvada. This is why it is sometimes called the Saptabhanginaya, that is the seven-limbed perspective. So what are the seven levels of truth? Well, these are this is really an exhaustive list of the senses in which, uh, or the truth values, you could say, um, a sentence can have uh, from various senses in which it is expressed. So a statement can be true from one perspective, but it can also be false from another perspective. Remember the blue facet of the diamond. Someone says this diamond is blue. Well, that's true of that facet, but it may be false of another facet. Both true and false, if you consider both facets. Indescribable, because there's another sense in which we can't really say whether something is true or not, because there may be facets of that entity. Again, if it has potentially infinite facets, there's always going to be some aspect of it that is not captured in what one is saying. So again, to go back to our example of the, the blue and the red facets of the diamond, let's say I say the diamond is blue. True when I'm talking about the blue facet, false if I'm talking about the red facet. Both true and false if I consider both of those as being aspects of the diamond in tandem. Indescribable in the sense that uh, there are aspects of the diamond to which the term color does not even apply. What about the hardness of the diamond? Uh, what about its existence through time? What about its location in space? Blue or red doesn't tell you anything about that, right? Those are indescribable. They're beyond the capacity of that particular claim to encompass them. There are three more levels of truth, which are the result of uh, combining these first four. Uh, there are only three because beyond three, then these start to become redundant. So you have something that can be true and indescribable, false and indescribable, true, false, and indescribable. And if you look, if you try to add to those seven, you're going to be repeating. Excuse me. <laughs> oh, excuse me. You're going to be repeating yourself. Uh, so you're going to say true, true, and indescribable. One of those truths is redundant. So these really are the seven possible truth values of any given claim. So an example of this, uh, the seven levels of truth. I was talking uh, before about facets of the diamond. Uh, there's another example we can use, a very simple one, uh, a pen. Uh, right? I've got one right here. Right? So like, let's use this pen as an example. This pen exists in as much as it embodies certain characteristics at a certain time. When I say certain characteristics, I mean pen characteristics, right? What is a pen? Well, 
it has a function. I have to be able to write with it. It uses ink. It has a certain shape. This is what makes it identifiable as a pen. But a pen does not exist in as much as it does not embody other characteristics or at other times. There was a time when this pen was not there, right? Before it was manufactured. There will come a time when it no longer exists. Uh, sorry, pen, but you know, you're know you impermanent. Uh, it will eventually pass away. So it doesn't exist in those times. It only exists during the period of its travia, right, of its endurance. Uh, and uh, a, the, a pen only embodies certain characteristics, right? That it, this does not have the characteristics of a of a notebook or of a washing machine or of an automobile, right? It just it has it, th those characteristics that embody it are present right now. The others do not exist. A real thing is you could say a nexus of the existence and non-existence of all the possible qualities in the universe. So the pen has you could say a relative or limited existence. A pen both and both does and does not exist if one takes into account both of the first two perspectives. And from yet another perspective, a pen's existence is indescribable. There may be as aspects and facets of this pen that uh, no statement I make about it can really capture. Um, I don't know what it's like to be this pen, for example. It's beyond something that I could possibly conceive of. And then you have the three possible non-redundant combinations of all of these four. So many modern Jain thinkers have seen the doctrine of, real, of relativity as an application of ahimsa, nonviolence, to the realm of philosophical discourse, such as uh, Acharya Mahapragya, uh, the late Acharya Mahapragya, pictured here. Uh, I live from 1920 to 2010. Uh, much of my own thought, in fact, on uh, these doctrines has been shaped by, by his writings, uh, which I uh, utilized when I wrote my dissertation on this topic back in the late 90s. Um, brilliant thinker, and, and he, he saw the capacity of these ideas to actually apply to the realm of nonviolence. Because if someone's saying the diamond's red, someone saying the, di the diamond's blue, someone's paying, saying the pen exists, someone's saying the pen doesn't exist, uh, these are the kinds of things that people fight about. Though usually we're not talking about diamonds and pens, we're talking about things like God, we're talking about things like morality or karma or the nature of existence itself. And of course, there's a vast diversity of schools of thought, religions, philosophies, and that diversity is a wonderful thing. Each school of thought reveals, sheds light on a different facet of existence, but typically they try to cancel each other out. And this can happen on, on the intellectual level, but that can very easily extend into the realm of how we actually treat other human beings with different worldviews. And of course, history is full of violence between members of different religious communities, people with different economic philosophies or political philosophies. Again and again, we see these things lead to violence. If we thought in terms of relativity, if rather than looking at difference and otherness, as a cause for conflict, we saw it instead as illuminating the multiple facets of reality. This would help us practice nonviolence. If you have a different worldview from me, rather than say, uh, oh, you, you are my enemy, or you must be wrong, or you saying I must be wrong, we say, oh, what can I learn from you? What can I learn from you about that other part of the elephant that I'm not feeling? So uh, to go back to the metaphor of the blind men and the elephant, Although it was not always conceived this way by pre-modern Jain thinkers, in fact, it was often used quite aggressively to show non-Jain perspectives as partial in contrast with the holistic truth of Jainism. Logically speaking, it can be used this way, right? Some scholars have argued, no, this is not really a hinsa because a lot of the ancient Jains were basically saying, you know, Hindu and Buddhist worldviews, if they were partially correct, that basically meant they were inadequate, the full truth could be seen in this more complex understanding of reality. Yes, that's how they were often used, but not always. Uh, there were Jain thinkers, even in ancient times, who saw these doctrines as a way of affirming, yes, there's something good in the other perspective. There's something true in the other perspective. They should all be respected. Both Haribhadra Suri, going back to the 5th uh, to 6th century of the Common Era, and Yashovidya, more recently in the 17th century, perceive the potential of these doctrines to express truth in a charitable way, right? They looked kindly on other traditions, uh, affirming what they saw as positive in other traditions. Haribhadra Suri, for example, very famously um, in his Yoga Drishti Samuchaya, a collection of views on yoga, 
he talks about the fact that there are differences in what various teachers say. And then he argues that this is because they were uh, presenting the ideas to different disciples at different times. But the ultimate truth they're all leading to is freedom from rebirth and uh, liberation, liberation from the cycle, ultimate bliss, nirvana. And so uh, they're really not in conflict. Uh, Yashovidya uh, also very famously uh, drew deeply from, from Hindu schools of thought and, and used uh, various uh, Hindu texts and approaches when he was uh, developing his Jain worldview. He didn't see these sources as something that were wrong or negative. Uh, he studied the Navya Nyaya, the, the New Logic School of Thought um, in Benares uh, during his lifetime. Uh, also, there are uh, several texts where he quotes extensively from the Bhagavad Gita without saying, oh, this is a non-Jain text, we shouldn't read this. No, he, he sees it as a source of wisdom, so he's tapping into it. So this is the, an example of this very non-violent approach to difference, drawing upon many, many sources. Today, many Jains see these doctrines as expressing the distinctively Jain version of worldview pluralism. Uh, worldview pluralism means basically the idea that many worldviews exist and are valuable, uh, that, that it's good that there's a diversity of worldviews. In the past, this has been called religious pluralism. I've also written about religious pluralism, but I see no reason why it should be limited to religions. Uh, there are many worldviews that are not religious. The word religion is also found problematic by many people, but worldviews, everybody has a worldview, right? So uh, everyone has a way of seeing reality. Uh, darshana is a good equivalent of worldview in Sanskrit. So uh, the, this is the Jain version of this idea of truth in many darshanas. Uh, this is the equivalent of Hindu concepts like dharma samanvaya, the harmony of religions, taught by Swami Vivekananda, or sarvadharma samabhava, the equality of religions, as taught by Mahatma Gandhi. So this is, this is a Jain philosophical version of that. In fact, Gandhi explicitly tapped into uh, Jain teaching. There's a letter uh, that he writes, uh, an editorial in one of his publications, where he talks about Anikantavad and Syadva. And he sees this as a way of viewing others' perspectives uh, in a complementary way rather than as antagonistic. So let's make this practical, right? Practical Anikantavada. Just as Swami Vivekananda sought to apply the concepts of Vedanta to daily living, developing the idea of practical Vedanta, we can similarly conceive of a practical Anekantavada, in which we apply the Jain philosophy of infinite diversity to our encounters with those whose worldviews differ from our own. The aim is to see otherness or difference not as a threat or the other as an enemy or a competitor, but to see otherness rather as evidence of the rich complexity of existence and the fact that there's always more to learn beyond the current horizons of our knowledge, more pieces of the proverbial elephant that we're not grasping. Then we can say with Swami Vivekananda, I accept all religions that were there in the past and worship with them all. I worship God with every one of them in whatever form they worship him. Not only shall I do all these, but I shall keep my heart open for all that may come in the future. We take in all that has been in the past, enjoy the light of the present, and open every window of the heart for all that will come in the future. Salutation to all the prophets of the past, to all the great ones of the present, and to all that are to come in the future. So this is, uh, of course, coming from Swami Vivekananda, from, from his Vedanta perspective. But the ultimate vision is very similar, right? That there are many perspectives, there are many diverse ways of understanding and approaching reality. And rather than simply hold on to our own and dismiss all the others, let us see all perspectives as capable of enlightening us, of showing us different facets of the truth. Of course, there's going to be disagreement. Of course, there will be different interpretations and ways of approaching reality. But the idea is that there's something we can learn from everyone. And to simply dismiss an entire worldview, an entire belief system uh, is, uh, is mistaken because uh, we're dismissing what might be valuable knowledge. This is a more nonviolent approach to otherness and difference than what has tended to predominate around the world. And uh, it's a, really a great gift, I would say, of uh, the Indic civilization to the world that not only the Jain version of this, but there are Hindu versions of this, there are Buddhist versions of this, uh, this pluralism uh, is really a wonderful gift, and uh, it's something that that uh, it would be great to see 
all of the world learn from uh, this and to uh, incorporate this much more open-minded perspective into our ways of thinking whenever we're dealing with a worldview, a philosophy, or a religious belief that's different from whatever we ourselves might hold. And uh, you, some of you might see the picture of, of, of Thakur, of Sri Ramakrishna behind me. Uh, he lived this kind of practical Anikantavada himself. I, I don't think he used that term. He wasn't Jain, but he practiced many different traditions. He, he followed sadhanas that were based in diverse forms of Hinduism, uh, in uh, Christianity and Islam, and he found samadhi, he found enlightenment in all of them. And so in the same way, in the spirit of practical Anikantavada, we need to listen to one another, be open to one another, and in this way learn to live together and with one another. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, I think I'm, I'm within my time, so that's good. Uh, and uh, again, I wish I could uh, be with you live and, and uh, get uh, all your wonderful questions and comments and learn from all of you. Uh, but when you watch this, I am going to be deep asleep. So uh, namaste again to everyone and uh, uh, all the best. so much for that wonderful insightful lecture and uh, i think this time in history we definitely require in this highly polarized world we definitely require this this very anikant uh, now uh, maybe professor paranjpe and professor pangaj would like to comment then we can throw it over to the uh, audience yes i was uh, listening intently and i know jeff for a while uh, you know, the, the actual challenge arises. Uh, in fact, uh, I want to relate it to what you said earlier and what uh, Chris also said about contradiction. You know, so at, a, at an epistemological level, my question is, is uh, Anekan Tawad uh, the same? I mean, does it accommodate contradiction? Because in modern logic, contradiction is not permitted, you know? Uh, Anyhow, but I think in a more practical way, let me put the question in a different uh, manner, which is that when when I said the the interaction, the dialogue between the Sanatani and the non-Sanatani is perfectly possible. But what about the Sanatani and the anti-Sanatani, you see? What is the room for Anekant Vad when someone wants to burn down your library or to break down the statues? And I put this question to a Jain Muni, in fact, you know, because when I went, when I entered the ashram, I saw a, an image of a figure with a bow and arrow. And I said, oh, this looks like Ram. You know? I mean, obviously, I don't know very much about Jainism. So I asked uh, Muni ji, I said, ye kaun hai? He said, ye ghanta karan hai, jo ek avtar mane jate hai. He's one of the viras, some 54 viras. And then I had a conversation with him about this. He said, in those days, actually, all the giants were used to be kings. They were all emperors, you know, before they gave up. And uh, they, he said that us zamane mein, I'll speak in Hindi a little us zamane mein jab ye aate the, koi bhi akraman karne aata tha, to ghanta bajate the. Aur us awaz se wo dar ke nikal jate the. So uh, that is, they would ring the bell, I mean, for my friends in Israel. And I began to think about it. I mean, there might have been a time when you rang a bell and people ran away. But if people are launching rockets and destroying you, and if you gave them a chance, they would push you into the ocean, you know. How would Anekant Vad work there? And then finally I asked him, he said, you know what? Uh, many of the Rajputs became giants in, uh, in Rajasthan. They got tired of fighting. They usually took on the name Heta. Uh, but they were money lenders to the kings, to the Raj. They, you see, the uh, even uh, Rana Pratap. You see, he was a he was a, completely he had lost Chittor, he lost everything, and the Bheels were supporting him. You know, but the financiers who were very wealthy giants. They continued to finance him. They said, "Look, you your cause is just." And apparently, Rana Pratap. So this is not in the history books. This is what the Muniji told me. So he said uh, that, uh, that Rana Pratap said, look, I have nothing. My lands are gone. My followers have deserted me and my fort is gone. You lose your, if you lose your money and I'm a Rajput, you know, I, I have to give you back what I took from. They said, 
don't worry because your causes just will will fund you so all these things made me think about again anekantvad contradiction you don't fight but you can support someone who's fighting and uh, so these are my questions these are some of my queries about the absolutism of non violence and this you see with gandhi ji i wrote a book about this partly and uh, and gandhi said uh, earlier he used to be absolutist but after independence and when there was a partition he accepted the immediacy of non violence or sorry of violence do he upheld the ultimacy of non violence okay the immediacy of violence the ultimacy of non violence why he said uh, well i mean if people are butchering each other then the state must restore law and order and and he also said uh, he said the non the violence of the brave is better than the non violence of the coward so with this i mean i i don't think either jeff is there or chris is there but maybe viraji you can answer or pankaj ji can answer uh, i think professor jain just uh, because it's 1 15 am there so i think he's just left but uh, oh. frankly i mean uh, i'll try i don't really have answers but i would just like to just uh, i mean i totally agree with you and uh, while jainism is also you know in a way uh, i would say tries to is also about contradictions but also it's a religion of paradox very much a religion of paradox uh, it's a religion of complete non position at the same time one of the wealthiest communities uh, there is a whole entire show of money and power and all of that now the ghandakan which you spoke about is supposed to also symbolically also supposed to destroy the ignorance uh, of the people so while there is a kind of you could say mundane explanation there is also kind of more of a philosophical explanations but you are very right i think of jain philosophers and even today the thinkers a uh, kind of you know struggle with this problem and i also had a question and i mean i've not really found the answer for that that does this also i mean the anekantvad also has a kind of you can say danger of accepting certain ideas and certain promoting certain you can say belief systems which may be harmful for certain other community so if i to give you a very simple example if some let's say somebody says that sati is uh, an acceptable practice for us and you know from our perspective it is correct does that mean that it is it should be allowed right you know in the sense what i mean is that there is that kind of a very fine balance between that uh, trying to incorporate all the plural ideas and multiple truths but at the same time you have to walk a very tight rope of sometimes what is right and what is wrong so i am totally i totally agree with you and i think the philosophers have still to continue to debate especially in today's world i think it is becoming even more difficult to, to you know navigate this kind of uh, questions but uh, frankly i don't really have answers but i think uh, I, Yes, uh, Sagiri, if you want to, you know, you have some comments, I believe. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Piraj. Now, uh, in talking about practical anekanta bada, Professor Long is not here, but we can take some of these issues further. Now, the whole idea, the vision, and practice of practical anekanta bada. as it is model on or it is draw inspiration from swami vivekananda's practical vedanta ask ourselves what is our nature of practice and practical and, and for example practical can have a connotation of practice understood in a naive sense or can resonate with a notion of pragmatism for example practical here involves a very different notion of practice and for example in anthropology we have a notion of practice which is mainly a habitual practice but there is also a domain of reflective practice tagore talks about sadhana i think practice in practical vedanta and anekanta bada has this dimension of both habitual practice and sadhana the other issue is that very notion of practice can be understood in an immanent way 
but the practice here involves both immanent and transcendence. And reference to Ramakrishna, Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda suggests that how their practical background, while being practical, also was mystical. Therefore, another dimension of practical Anekanta Bhada has to involve this border crossing between the practical and the mystical. And the vision and practice of Anekanta Bhada, especially as it touches on the plural, also involves the questions and practices of what I would like to call ethics, aesthetics, and responsibility. There is an ethics involved. The question that Makaran is posing, traditions. Now, of course, all thought systems, all worldviews, all ways have a limit condition. And, and, and in certain way, these limit conditions we understand as Gandhi understood the limits of non-violence, not only at the last stage, but also from an early on, from his ashram life also. So therefore, the limits condition is one. But how do we deal with limit situation? And I am referring to not only ethics, but also a kind of aesthetic cultivation. Maybe your work on art, in fact, the cultivation of this practical on Ekantavada, through practices of art, it gives that kind of an aesthetic border crossing preparation. And, and finally, I think the notion of pluralism, as it has been talked about, worldview pluralism is very interesting. But what it entails is also shift from pluralism to varieties of pluralization. And, and therefore, to understand pluralism, what I would like to call as a meditative process of pluralization involving both action and meditation. So in this way, we can join this very interesting pathway started by Professor Long and bring this idea of practical Anekanta Bhada in conversation, not only with practical Vedanta, but also many interesting you know, uh, philosophies and practices from other religions and traditions. Yes, Professor Paranjpur. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ananta Bhai. Uh, just when you were talking, I remembered a book uh, edited by Chris Chappell and Arindam Chakravarti because, you know, all these uh, connections suddenly spring up and the book is called Engaged Emancipation, you know. So it's similar to what you were saying, practical Anekantavad, practical Vedanta, order crossing, action and reflection, meditation and, uh, you know, morality or responsibility. Uh, and uh, this is this is that, uh, uh, should I say, union between yoga, union between, um, you know, uh, action and contemplation that we as academics also cherish and long for as a lifelong sadhana for bringing that uh, across because I don't think that uh, emancipation, whether you want to call it Nirvana or Trivalya or Moksha or Mukti or whatever, all these names from different traditions, I don't think, I don't think it meant some sort of retreat from the world, you know, and even those who meditated in caves, I don't think were uh, non-actors. Somebody asked, uh, you know, Raman Maharishi, because whenever people were tremendously, uh, should I say, anxious and had a burnout in the freedom struggle, you know, they felt it was useless. The British power was impossible to defeat and all. Gandhiji used to send them to Raman Maharishi in Trivarnamalai. And Raman Maharishi didn't utter a word. Usually he never spoke. And uh, then when some of these Congress and other people went, leaders, uh, they said, look, what's, what are you doing for the country? This is the question they asked him. What are you doing for the country? We are struggling and, uh, and uh, etc. And then he answered, you know, he said that don't think that by sitting quietly, we are doing nothing. You know, He said that, uh, you know, we are performing the highest form of action, the, the, the jnani, 
And in that sense, I'm answering my own question. The truly nonviolent Muni is performing the highest form of action against violent acts all over the world without seemingly uh, picking up, uh, you know, any weapon. I think that they are able to change the minds of humanity through their uh, utter and, and complete abstinence of uh, injury. And uh, I, I'm reminded of a phrase of Gyanendra Kumar uh, Jain, Gyanendra Kumar Jain, sorry, who said that uh, ahimsa, ahimsa ek akramak prem ka naam hai. I'm, I'm paraphrasing or rephrasing. He said ahimsa is not passive. Ahimsa is very active. And it is an engaged and active love which disarms the worst of opponents. And actually, Gandhi believed this. He said, we will have a Shanti Sena. Vinoba tried it. But perhaps human consciousness has not reached that level. And people today mock Gandhiji. They said, you tried. You could have tried it with Hitler. He would have shot you in one minute. And all your followers would have been rounded up and, uh, and sent to the gas chamber. So uh, uh, maybe there's a different notion of limits here that is working. But I think we should close now with the, with the hope and belief that human consciousness is capable of transformation, is amenable to, to peace, and uh, is amenable to appeals which are supra-rational, you know, because uh, that's, this is where anekantva, contradiction, and plura, pr plurality or, or radical pluralism come in. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Viraji. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Makran, if you permit, can I just say one thing? Of course, of course. So, the floor so, is yours. So, I was just No, just, make... just one last thing. You know, no, you're no, right. I was... Just last comment. I was just going to make a little announcement, which is I invite everybody, everybody, please come back at 2.45 p.m. after lunch. And we have an open session. Certainly, Saji Varghese ji uh, has yeah. much to say. Hi. We will save it for that session. Or, or, or you can come in now, no problem. But first, first Viraji, then you, and then we break now, and we, we reassemble at 2.45, please. Thank you. Viraji, first you. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Now, I would just like to, my last comment is uh, connecting Professor Long's lecture and Professor uh, Chappell's lecture. I think there is a lot of scope in developing this Indian epistemological and dialectical uh, models to teach in our class to our students, especially the classes of ethics and critical thinking, which are usually with the Western ideas and Western, uh, you can say Western um, systems and Western models. There is so much of scope to, to develop the, all these ideas, epistemological and didactical, didactical ideas, Indian models, and teach our students. So it's very important that we incorporate some of this uh, knowledge system in our education system, in our undergraduate and postgraduate uh, curricula. And uh, not necessarily Jain, Anikantavad, but all the across, you know, Brahmanical, Buddhist, and uh, and uh, Jain, of course. So thank you so much. Uh, it was such a pleasure. And Professor uh, Paraspe, it's really such a pleasure uh, to just listen to you. So we'll definitely be there in the afternoon. So thank you so much. Thank you, Viraji. Thank you. Your point is really well taken because uh, I think we need to broaden our epistemic horizons. And I think these uh, philosophies, these methodologies uh, will really empower us and will enable us to understand uh, each other better and also accept diversity, you see, at all levels without, as it were, compromising because people are very anxious these days about unity, security, na you know, nationality, these issues. I think in a non-action anxious space without compromising uh, you know, uh, uh, these these profoundly, should I say, important, important imperatives of our times. Uh, there, there will be ways of accommodation without yielding to the so-called breaking India narratives, which we've seen in such great uh, uh, proliferation, proliferation in these last decades. Thank you, Sajiji. You have the last word. And after that, we will break for lunch. Uh, Mr. Saji Varghese, please. Just say a few words about yourself. Thank you. Professor Makrant, I live in the remotest part of our country. 
the northeast part of our country that I live. So I am not very really sure whether the connectivity is there at all, whether you are able to hear me at all from here. Anyway, thank you so much. I have a quick comment on last paper. I do not know whether it was a Swamiji who was presenting. I don't get to see the video, but I could hear what he was speaking. So in response to that, in a comment as well. Somewhere he seemed to have mentioned about the dharma. And in contrast to that, he spoke about adharma. Now he seen that dharma could have been the result of sattva, connecting it with our Sankhya tradition. Rightly so. But in contrast to it, he said that adharma could have come from I have some difficulty in accepting because different, and the product of it is also the development and confusion. I am given to I am given to uphold this particular point that adharma could be the result of rajas. Rajas stands for activity and also the opposite of what is being produced by sattva. This is comment on what has been pointed out. Now, sattva bhaminaya literally translated as seven forms of judgment. This is what has been pointed out also by the presenter, the Swamiji who presented the paper. Now, that means seven forms of judgment, the reality or the object, can be looked at from various perspectives, rightly so. The seven dimensions from where the reality can be perceived. Reality, I refer to any object. In an epistemology, we have a subject, we have an object. The object is being objectified by the subject. So there are seven dimensions of the object. Now, the first form is called Syad Asti. Syad literally translated as perhaps, perhaps. No, perhaps takes us to only probabilities, not certainty. So I am given to believe that. So the second one, the second is, perhaps the object does not exist. Another standpoint. Now the third is contradiction, which you had also pointed out, Arkan that syad astika nastika perhaps the object exists and also the object does not exist this is where the contradiction comes in now i even to believe that with all these perhaps that we are pointing out or the school points out the jaya school points out it doesn't take us to any certainty at all it takes us only probability this is my observation about the school. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Varghis. I think I remember you, uh, uh, not in Nehu, but are you in the uh, in a college in Shillong? Am I right? Yes, you're right, sir. I'm in Lady Key College. Exactly. There. Exactly. I think in Bangalore in one of the in Bangalore, sir. In exactly. In St. Joseph's, in St. Joseph's College. Exactly, exactly. Wonderful. So I appreciate your comment. I appreciate your comment. Your voice was also breaking from time to time. And from Kerala to Shillong, wonderful. You've spanned the length and breadth of the country. But, you know, two points you made, very important. The first point was how do you derive adharma, whether it is from Tamas or Rajas. I mean, these are extremely technical points, and uh, it depends on uh, how Sankhya is being unpacked. I don't believe after Hari Haranandha Giri, Aranya, sorry, Hari Haranandha Aranya, he had a very authentic uh, teacher of Sankhya. You see, Sankhya is, a, is shrouded in mystery, though, in a way, it is, it is the foundational, uh, I think, uh, uh, system of Indian philosophy, because Sankhya enumeration uh, of the tattvas, etc., it percolates into all other philosophical systems. So this will 
take a huge amount of time to unpack. And uh, again, you know, there's always a problem, in my view, to derive uh, modern ideas of ethics. Yesterday, I talked about Vivekananda, who, uh, sorry, about Radhakrishnan, uh, who was countering in his uh, Christian college uh, uh, BA Honours philosophy thesis that Vedanta has no ethics. So uh, the point is that when you enumerate uh, the, the tattvas, you see, uh, where is the question of ethics uh, or for that matter, uh, dharma, you see? Uh, and in the Sankhya world, the, the category of dharma doesn't come. Even Ishvara is a later introduction. So, I mean, these are, these are not things we can just solve at, at the drop of a hat. Secondly, Jeffrey Long, I mean, he was dressed in a saffron t-shirt. I doubt whether he's a Swamiji. Uh, I, I know his wife as well. But that doesn't mean anything. I mean, the fact is that he's a, he's a, I think, a fairly enlightened and practicing type of uh, person. And then finally, what you said about Syadvat, again, uh, Syadvat, Anekantvat, this has to be studied in great depth, in my view. Once again, we need proper teachers because uh, when you say certainty and probability, you can turn it and say, Perhaps it is certain, perhaps it is probable, perhaps it is impossible. I don't know. See, because even the Nasadiya Sutra says, Sukta says that perhaps he knows, perhaps he also doesn't know. So again, I would think certainty, probability, possibility, contradiction, these are, again, they belong to a different terminological universe. And I think uh, I, I always remember my one of my teachers, uh, in when it came to philosophy, Professor K.J. Shah, uh, who learned from Wittgenstein. I'm not a student of philosophy, I'm a student of literature, but sitting with philosophers, you pick up a few things. And he used to always tell me that when you look at a classical text, whether it's Plato or whether it is Anikantwa, when you look at a classical text or doctrine, the first imperative is to articulate the coherence of the text not to superimpose other categories. And that's so difficult because we don't know that world. It's a universe of ideas and we are from a different universe of ideas. That's why yesterday I was talking about the bridge. And for me, the bridge is the 19th century when many of these things were rediscovered really as it were, or they were taken out of very narrow confines of, uh, uh, you know, limited ashrams where they were already declining. So. I think in the open session, we can bring up some of these ideas about how to read a classical text and uh, how not to read, by the way, how not to read a classical text. That's equally a challenge to us. And I think a lot of careful work has to be done of the kind that Chris Chappell himself has done. A lot of careful work. Yesterday, Pankaji uh, mentioned that you have to go and visit and there has to be an engagement uh, which we hardly do. Our approach is very textual. And I've always found, I mean, as I said, I still don't know much about Jainism, but the little bit that I've got in flashes has come because I was sitting with a Muni and he would say things and they would affect me. And similarly, uh, I've learned a little bit about, uh, as it were, practical Hinduism, if you want to call it that, by, by going to ashrams, by seeing very rich people. I mean, I haven't, uh, as it were, met Ramana Maharishi, but when I went to the ashram, when I went to Shurvind Ashram, I learned certain things I couldn't learn from books. This is what I'm trying to say. And I think somebody said yesterday that this is a living uh, tradition, this is a living philosophy. And so just a textual or bookish approach is not sufficient. That will lead to a scholasticism of a sort which will not be enabling. And anyhow, We've carried on very long, and perhaps, perhaps it's time to go to lunch. Okay, I use that word perhaps, uh, and let's uh, let's meet again at uh, two forty-five. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Virajji. Your presence has been very benign, and uh, I would uh, love to sit in in one of your classes if ever I get a chance to talk about the art history of giants and and how uh, a gym himself, after being uh, a conqueror of all enemies, even though he's a human being, becomes as magnificent as the Akhanda Purusha. How 
Human beings can best the deities, the gods themselves. And of course, there's no room for women, I'm afraid. I don't see a woman Tirthankar anywhere, which is another problem altogether. Uh, and today we don't accept, I wouldn't accept that a woman cannot be, uh, cannot reach the highest level. Uh, I asked again Muniji this question and he said, do you mean to say women should walk about naked? You know, shut up, something like that. So he, he shut me up. I kept quiet. So we'll, we'll end on that note. Uh, thank you. And we'll come back in the open session. Bye-bye.